Hello there, healthcare humans. Thank you so much for coming back for another episode of The Other Human in the Room. So um, this episode is dedicated to the idea of pleasure. That might be just a cringe word up top. I don't know. How do you feel about me talking about pleasure for the next 45 minutes? Um, so the reason that I wanted to dedicate an entire episode to this idea, the idea of pleasure, is because it is actually the main idea, the main theme that I am working um, for myself personally in my life. I'm recording this episode like at the beginning of January 2024, and um, I was really reflecting on where I am now in my life, um, including like what I have already created in my life. So I have created space and time in my life for myself, for my humanity. I have learned how to rest and how to be present with myself. I have learned how to stop worrying as much. I've learned how to metabolize painful emotions, let go of the stories behind them. That's a lot of what I talk about on this podcast. And um, of course, when I say I've learned how to do all of those, it's not like I've totally nailed it and don't do ongoing learning and work on it. It's an ongoing process and practice, of course. But I feel like I have a, a good sense of that. Um, things that used to preoccupy me don't anymore. And that means I have like the mental bandwidth as well as like the literal time, space and energy to invite more good things into my life. And the thing I discovered as I did that is that it's deeply uncomfortable, anxiety provoking, guilt inducing for me to do that. And I've been in an ongoing process of like exploring why. And this year I want to do it with even more intention. I usually choose like a word or two for each year as sort of the themes and the things I want to try and view the year through and make sure if I'm, you know, making a decision of how to spend my time, how does it incorporate this thing in it, right? So this year, my main word is enjoy. I like the word enjoy because when I like looked up the definitions and the word origins, um, it means like to rejoice, to take delight in, to savor. Um, it also means to give joy, which I think is fun. So not only is this to enjoy something that I'm doing internally with myself, but it's also like a communal in, interpersonal thing where a part of how I enjoy is by giving joy away. And I think that feels very true. It's not something you can hoard or keep to yourself, you know? Um, I want to really savor what is good, what feels good about life, right? And um, and through that find satisfaction, you know, some of that sense of enoughness, I think you can only really find as you learn how to enjoy things more then you then you actually understand what it is that you're feeling and then get a sense of when you've had enough and so the last sort of definition of the word enjoy that i haven't mentioned yet is to take pleasure in to enjoy something is to experience it in, an, in a pleasurable way and i don't know about you but that is not something i was socialized to think about actively at all. Yes, there's some amount of like, you know, let's um, enjoy life, let's have fun, live life to the fullest. Certainly the, those messages are out there. But especially for those of us that went into healthcare, most of our lives up to this point, potentially, um, have been about setting aside our own pleasure in order to help other people. Um, we have a lot of um, unhelpful but common stories within our medical culture that are about, um, you know, self-sacrifice and being a martyr and suffering for the cause. And, and we can actually judge people if they're enjoying themselves too much. What's wrong with them? They're not taking their job seriously. It's not professional to take delight in things, right? Like there's, there's, there's all sorts of coded messages that, that are within our current medical culture. And that is actually one of the main reasons that I want to out loud say to all of you, I'm spending this year learning how to enjoy things more because it's countercultural. It's not something that we typically talk about. It's sort of a must be nice for you, but I'll keep it to myself because I don't want people to judge me or resent me or those sorts of things. And so me saying it out loud to you is one of the ways that I'm sort of practicing 
not only pleasure for myself, but I'm practicing pleasure activism. And that's what I think I'm going to title this episode is like becoming a pleasure activist, pleasure activism. I'm actually going to go into a bit more detail later on in this podcast, but it's an idea that's not mine. Um, it's the title of a book and a set of ideas from one of my faves, Adrienne Marie Brown, who also wrote Emergent Strategy. I have a whole previous episode that talks about that. Um, the book Pleasure Activism just basically talks about why if you're interested in social change, if you're interested in rehumanizing our existence on this planet, whether it's healthcare in particular or just like the world at large, practicing pleasure and increasing our personal capacities for pleasure and intentionally enjoying our lives is actually one powerful way that we can do activism in the world. I think a lot of people, if you are in any way connected with doing change making or system transformation, or if you view yourself as an activist, a lot of that culture can be very still grind culture, very angry, which those are valid ways, especially being angry is valid, of course. Um, it's a lot of intensity and those are beautiful, but also um, what this whole book kind of posits is sitting back, leaving space and actually intentionally creating and protecting our space for pleasure to enjoy our own lives. That is a radical act in a society that only wants us for, you know, how hard we can hustle that um, in many ways um, exploits our desire to be martyrs and suffer, right? Um, who like many parts of society and messages we get are very fear-based that want us to be in sort of that fight or flight. So that makes us more um, inclined to react and um, hustle and do more and do more, right? So being a pleasure activist is about maybe doing less. Well, no, I won't even say maybe. It, it will involve doing less, especially doing less of things you don't enjoy that you think you have to do. And instead, it can be about doing things that actually bring you pleasure, bring you joy. So um, I want to spend this episode talking about why this is important, what this means to me. I'm going to, I'm going to read some excerpts from pleasure activism, of course. <laughs> um, I want to get into the specifics of like how I do it, you know? Um, and I thought a fun way to sort of start that was, um, you know, in a more concrete way, just talk about some of my current pleasure practices. I talked a bit about things that I was enjoying and that were bringing me pleasure in um, my episode that I did at the end of my summer sabbatical last year. Um, and so this is a bit of an update from that. Some of those things I definitely are still enjoying. Um, but like what really, I'm not simply talking about like anything I do, I'm going to find joy and find pleasure in it. That is one way I am practicing pleasure, but I'm also being very intentional about like what I make time for in my schedule, what um, kinds of things I am listening to, watching, reading, consuming, if you will, am I really enjoying those things, right? And so here are some things I thought I would give a little list of things that are currently a part of my pleasure practices. Um, one of the newest sources of joy and pleasure that I have been interacting with over the last several months um, is one that you may too, because she's very popular, especially right now. Maybe it's a bit basic to be enjoying her, but like, it's just like guilty pleasures mean nothing. Basic pleasures, who cares? Coolness is a construct, right? I've been really enjoying Taylor Swift, along with many others in this world, right? Um, following the journey of the tours and watching those um, and really just like um, I've been listening to this podcast that kind of goes through the like history of how she got to this point and the meanings behind her songs and thinking of and like listening to people talk about like how she writes her music and um, why she writes in the way she writes and also just listening to her music because there's a lot of it and um, there's something for every season and mood that you could be in. And um, a specific way that I found especially quite like nourishing and refreshing and energizing for me, um, it's also a kind of, I don't know if it would count as meditation, you know, whoever's in charge of deciding what counts as meditation, <laughs> um, but uh, 
I've been memorizing and singing um, her songs. Um, this is something I actually did several years ago. Um, I just noticed that on my drive to work or back, my, my brain would often be swirling with lots of thoughts and worries of the day. And an initial sort of mindfulness practice that I did for several months was um, memorizing and singing the lyrics to the musical Hamilton. So at this point, I never finished it because it's a, it's a long musical, but the majority of the songs in the first act, I think I still have pretty well memorized in my head. And there's something about that process of learning a song, like you have to kind of keep replaying it to actually memorize the words and that, so that keeps your brain engaged. And then singing, singing is such an embodied sense. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a full body experience to sing. It's very soothing to our nervous systems. And so I still do sometimes sing Hamilton and other musicals and things I like, but the latest um, artists to join my, like I have a sing-along playlist are um, songs from Taylor Swift and I am really enjoying her. So that is one example of like an actual pleasure practice. This morning before I sat down to do this podcast, I was singing along to some of her music. Um, another one of my pleasure practices that I think will always continue to evolve, but be a part of my life is like some kind of movement. And especially in the, well, actually throughout my life, I have always loved dancing. Um, I took ballet up to grade six and I actually didn't really enjoy like dance class. It felt too perfectionistic and structured, but just like, like some of my favorite memories from childhood are like dance parties with my sisters in our living room, like dancing to different songs and different CDs. Um, and that I've really brought back in over the last several years as when my main, one of my main sources of exercise are like cardio dance workouts. I've mentioned before on this podcast, how much I love fitness Marshall. I went to a concert of his last year when he came to Toronto and that was like a spiritual experience, like dancing to these choreographed moves with other people who also enjoyed him. He's like a YouTuber. Um, and more recently, I've also found a bunch of um, cardio dance workouts online on YouTube that are Taylor Swift. And so I've been, I have a whole Taylor Swift cardio dance playlist now. <laughs> if you want it, I'll share it with you. Um, I, so that's been so fun. So it's sort of marrying, like, I'm just like bathing myself in Taylor Swift's world. And then now I get, I have workouts where I can like dance along to them as, as well. And that's been very fun. And the latest thing that I haven't actually started yet as of this recording, but we'll start next week is I have signed up for dance classes, which is not something that I have done in a very, very long time. Um, I got a chance to try out a, a kind of dance class at the end of last year that was super fun. And I found one that was now that's local to me and um, it's gonna be contemporary dance classes. So um, I, if anyone out there is a So You Think You Can Dance fan, I loved So You Think You Can Dance, the reality show when it first came out and watched it fervently for several years, the like the very early seasons and contemporary was one of, that's where I learned like the term contemporary is it's like kind of like ballet, but more expressive. And um, I'm so excited. I'm really curious to see how it will be. You know, maybe it will be more like those ballet class, classes of my youth, but I don't think so because we're all going to be adults. They say any skill levels allowed, which better be true because I I'm not very flexible. <laughs> I am growing in flexibility as I've been doing more yoga, but I am still not. And so it's not going to be about being good at it or having skill level, but it's going to be about moving my body and learning how to move my body in ways to music and moving my body to choreography where I, I'm moving with other people and we're sort of moving intentionally. I just really enjoy that. And so that's another pleasure practice. Um, um, another one that I've been doing a lot of recently is reading still. I've been really on a nonfiction kick for a long time, but in the summer and fall, I've re-picked up reading fiction and really exclusively the only fiction I've been reading is like romantic comedy books. So what they used to call chick flicks, but or chick flicks, I guess that's the movie version, but like chick lit, I think is like the misogynistic um, term, but I've been really, I read all of the Emily Henry books and all the very McFarland books. And there's, she has several, um, anything that's like witty, but complicated people 
that you're a little annoyed that they don't just figure out that they should be together, but then you get to like watch them overcome perceived obstacles and then get together in the end. Very satisfying. Um, I've been really enjoying those. Um, as well as some satisfying uh, fan fiction for different TV shows that I used to enjoy um, where, you know, fans write fan fiction about alternate endings where different people get together. I've, I've also restarted reading a bit of that and finding that very enjoyable. So those are my main pleasure practice. Oh, right. The other one I wanted to mention um, in sort of like the TV realm is I, my husband and I just really enjoyed watching the entirety of Ted Lasso. Um, it's on Apple TV plus. So we had to like get a new subscription specifically for it, but it was worth it. And I strongly recommend it. <laughs> so yeah, like a variety of pleasure practices, like including, so, you know, things that I've always enjoyed, but the idea is like, if I do it intentionally, and if I notice how these different activities are impacting my body and savor them and actually pay attention and enjoy them, I'm just curious to see what dividends I shall reap from said activities. So those are just some examples. Yours can be whatever, like what brings you pleasure? Is it cooking? Is it hanging out with friends? Like what is it, right? Um, and so as you consider for yourself, me giving you those examples, um, what is it that would bring you pleasure? I want to talk about why I really think it's so important for us to consider adding more pleasure into our lives. And so the first reason is that as a human being in a human body, your body and mine are made for pleasure. The pleasure is like baked in as a part of our organic human experience, right? Like when you think about, so why do we have a heart? We have a heart, so our heart can move blood around our body so we can like literally be alive and get all the nutrients and oxygenation and everything we need through the body. Right? Like that's why we have a heart. Why do we have pleasure? Like think about it the same way. It's another like system of our body. It's a part of our nervous system is the pleasure branch of our sensory system, right? We don't really think of it that way. We think of it again, like this foreign concept, just the way we've been socialized to think that emotions are this foreign concept. Pleasure is a piece of how our body communicates with us. And it's an, a really important thing to communicate. So just the same way that it's important for our bodies to communicate pain, because that lets us know when something is hurting us or about to hurt us, or there may be threat or danger, right? Pleasure is equally important to let us know what some when something is actually nourishing to us, where it's where something that is a, a resource to us that will allow us to improve our well-being or maintain our survival that it's a source of something that's going to give us energy and strength that's what pleasure is so it's like the most natural thing in the world to feel pleasure and to invite pleasure into our lives and and i mean whether we invite it in or not like pleasure is a part of our human experience you might not feel that way to you depending on how rough you're feeling right now, how burnt out you're feeling. It can feel so foreign to be like, pleasure is a part of our human experience. Maybe yours lady, but not mine, right? But it actually is like, it's it's baked into our bodies. All bodies have an incredible capacity to experience pleasure. And our bodies want to be offering us pleasure all the time. It's the, when you feel pleasure, that's a signal from our bodies that this is something that is, nourishing and supportive and a resource to us. That's what pleasure is, right? But this feels odd. And in part because we often are so bombarded with threat signals, danger stories, painful experiences that it's hard to actually remember that we also do feel pleasure. But when you think about it, like, so what's sort of the ideal state of a human body, you know, and I'm not even thinking sort of morally or idealistically, like what I mean is our bodies want to stay alive. They want to keep us alive and thriving. So they're letting us know all the threats out there through emotions like fear and anxiety so that we can like tend to the threats. They let us know through pain or disgust if there's things that are actually harming us right now. And so say we removed all of those threats and all of those harms 
what would be left? Pleasure. Pleasure is what would be left because it would be like, look, ah, here's a delightful piece of food that brings you pleasure because it's nourishing to you versus another piece of food that tastes terrible that you feel disgusted because it's off or it's poisonous or it's something that you don't want to eat. You see what I mean? Like it's literally a signal. It's an organic biological signal that um, our bodies are always inviting us to orient ourselves towards. It also has been deeply exploited by our society, which is sort of the next point. So we have been deeply socially conditioned to distrust, reject, and like shame feeling pleasure. And I always think about, so like, um, I'm in this like Facebook group for physician moms and I actually don't remember the original context. It was a while ago now, but I was replying to someone who was asking for advice. I was adding my little advice comment in. And one of the things I was saying is like, kind of giving them permission if they wanted to say like, if you want, you can just do what feels good in this scenario. Like that can be the guiding force that you use to understand what you do. And someone replied to that comment saying like, I don't think it's a good idea to tell someone to just do what feels good. That's what leads to drug addiction. And I think that is kind of the story. It's like pleasure is dangerous. Being like a hedonist and seeking pleasure, that is not just wasteful, but dangerous and will lead to addiction. But that is not really the story of addiction, right? Like actually, um, I always think about the rat park experiment. Have you heard of that experiment? Um, I looked it up because I wanted to actually like cite my sources a bit. So apparently an American psychologist, Dr. Bruce Alexander, did these experiments in the 70s that have been known to be called like the rat park experiments. And so because like other experiments had been done earlier and people kind of cite these experiments a lot too, where there was rats in a cage with nothing but like two water bottles and one was filled with water and like nutrients. So what would actually keep them alive? And then the other one is filled with like heroin or co cocaine typically. So like a drug, right? And those drugs, they do exploit our pleasure systems, right? So heroin really exploits one part of our pleasure system. Cocaine really exploits another part, which then our bodies go, oh, well, this brings a lot of something that might be good and you want to keep using it, right? And the traditional way we think about like drugs and addiction is like, see, those substances are so dangerous and bad and see like us as mammals, because I guess it's rats in this case, but we always use this as an analogy to us, like see humans, like if we expose ourselves to too much pleasure, what happens? So in the original experiments where it was the two bottles in the cage with the rat and nothing else, the rats would continually drink the drug laced bottles even and like not drink the like nutrient rich bottles and they would just all overdose and die or just like starve basically like they would only they would they would be so hardwired to just be like give me all of that good pleasure and we would hear that as like the whether you hear that exact experiment being cited still the idea of like see like if we if we just orient to pleasure we'll just never stop consuming it and then we will die and we'll like neglect all of our other worldly responsibilities. And so um, the thing though, from the rat park experiment is like, is it actually the drug that's making them act this way? Or is it the setting they're in? It's a rat by itself with two bottles. And the in that setting, the rat by themselves with two bottles they were really going ham on the drug filled one to the extent that they end up dying. So what they did is they actually put rats in these rat parks where they were with other rats. They could roam around. So they weren't in like a small cage. They had like space to roam around, to play. They had like rat toys in there and like fun things. They could um, have sex with each other. They could interact with each other. They could like, um, they could do all the things that rats also enjoy doing beyond, you know, ju just like existing. Um, and when they put the two bottles in that one, the rats usually actually prefer the nutrient filled one. And they would still actually sometimes imbibe is the word they use, like imbibe with like the drug filled bottle, but they do it like intermittently, not to excess, not obsessively, not overdosing, right? So the idea is like, having other things in your life that bring you pleasure is actually the antidote to drug addiction in this case, right? So it's like, 
we think do what feels good will lead us down horrible paths that they're on the streets and we're hooked on all the things, but no, it's actually the deprivation of all the, the rich tapestry of ways we can feel alive, feel human, feel pleasure. If we deprive ourselves of those, we are more vulnerable to these very singular sources of mainly like the chemical sense of pleasure versus how pleasure can kind of naturally be induced by experiences in our environment. Okay. So what if we were all setting up our own rat parks is basically what I'm saying. Like, what if we really thought of like, that's actually, Ooh, that's actually a really important reason to continue to have multiple sources of pleasure in my life, including socialization with others, including things where I notice that like, not only do I feel the hit of pleasure, but I feel satisfied by that for it actually nourishes me. Right. So um, it's very counter to the narrative that pleasure is not the problem. A pursuit of pleasure because everything else in your life is so deprived, sure, that can have painful consequences, but it's not pleasure that's the problem. Pleasure is actually like the thing that's going to let us know what is good in our lives if we pay attention and get to know pleasure and are, are familiar with how our body reacts and offers and experiences pleasure, right? If we've never felt pleasure before and then suddenly we do a drug, that's when we're like, hello, I guess this is the only way I'm ever going to feel this feeling. But if we've actually invited pleasure into our lives in many ways, now we have a rich rat park <laughs> of pleasure. So that was the second point I wanted to make is that we are we have these really false inhuman counter narratives about pleasure that aren't true and that leave us feeling very guilty or anxious or averse to experiencing pleasure. We're, we've been told that pleasure is dangerous, right? And so then the third point, which is what I mentioned at the beginning, pa practicing pleasure is a radical act of resistance in a world that shames us and falsely creates fear and distrust of pleasure in us. So this is where the, the work of Adrienne Marie Brown and pleasure activism comes into play. One of the very first things that she says in this book is that pleasure is a measure of freedom, right? And so when you think about it, like you think about that rat experiment, you know, there are people where their lives are almost like that original rat cage situation where so much has been taken away from them because of whatever it's war or famine, or they're like literally in jail or whatever. And right. And so then their sources of pleasure are, are being deprived, like having multiple sources of pleasure and, and really enjoying them and inviting them into our lives is is a measure of freedom. A lot of us feel really trapped and stuck and like we couldn't possibly make different choices in our lives, do different, do different things with our lives. And for most of us, in many ways, at least, a lot of these beliefs are false. They have been socially conditioned into us. I couldn't possibly work less is a false message unless one of you is an indentured servant, right? But for most of the rest of us, there is actually, like, actually, we could work less and enjoy our lives more. And doing so, therefore, is like literally an act, an embodiment of the freedom that we actually have in our lives, right? So I wanted to read a passage for you um, from Pleasure Activism, um, just because it's really good. And it explains what pleasure activism, activism is quite well, I think. So pleasure activism is the work we do to reclaim our whole happy and satisfiable selves from the impacts, delusions, and limitations of oppression and or supremacy. Pleasure activism asserts that we all need and deserve pleasure and that our social structures must reflect this. In this moment, we must prioritize the pleasure of those most impacted by oppression. Pleasure activists seek to understand and learn from the politics and power dynamics inside of everything that makes us feel, glue, feel good. This includes sex and the erotic, drugs, fashion, humor, passion work, connection, reading, cooking, eating, music, and other arts, and so much more. Pleasure activists believe that by tapping into the potential goodness in each of us, we can generate justice and liberation, growing a healing abundance where we have been socialized to believe only scarcity exists. Right. This is the rat part thing. 
Pleasure activism acts from an analysis that pleasure is a natural, safe, and liberated part of life and that we can offer each other tools and education to make sure sex, desire, drugs, connection, and other pleasures aren't life-threatening or harmful, but life-enriching. Pleasure activism includes work and life lived in the realms of satisfaction, joy, and erotic aliveness that bring about social and political change. Ultimately, pleasure activism is us learning to make justice and liberation the most pleasurable experiences we can have on this planet. Amen. That's, I, I don't know how to say more than that. I just think um, summarizes it really well. And you include, like, I'm curious if any of you listening to me saying that, like, there are things in there that we have a lot of social codes to think are dangerous inherently or shameful inherently. So she talks about sex. And if you look at the cover of Pleasure Activism, it's actually just a bunch of animals having sex, but they're like cute and little. So at first you're like, look at these cute animals. And you're like, oh, they're all having sex with each other. So certainly the book talks about sex is, I mean, very much a natural part of how our bodies experience pleasure. Drugs are also in there, if you notice. And so that's a really interesting one to consider because we have a lot of very strong narratives about drugs. Um, I will say that for myself personally, um, I don't have a current practice of regularly using drugs other than intermittent alcohol to as a source of pleasure. And that would be my only one right now. And I'm also considering that one, how often and what I do with it. We have a lot of um, cultural narratives around drugs. But as I've just talked about with the rat park thing, it's interesting if maybe that narrative isn't the full story, right? What if it's actually not about demonizing, shaming, and stigmatizing certain kinds of pleasure, including drugs, but diversifying the whole thing and having multiple sources, like, like she mentions the rest of that list, right? Um, so I feel like that's a, a great summary of pleasure activism and why I want to be a pleasure activist. I want to have, to be as resourced as I can for myself to have a good life because we each get one of these, right? We get one of these lives, why not enjoy it? But beyond that, because I, I deeply believe that good change is possible, that we can rehumanize healthcare, for example, as the main focus of this podcast and the main focus of my work, I believe we can find better ways to care for our patients. And the way that I, I am convinced that we are actually going to get this done is through the portal of rehumanizing ourselves. And a huge part of rehumanizing ourselves is by actually opening ourselves up and recognizing our capacity for pleasure and embodying that by inviting pleasure into our lives on a regular basis. It is when I feel resourced and in connection with my goodness and abundance, which is what you feel like when you are experiencing pleasure, that is actually a source of power, a source of energy, a source of motivation, and also like literally like a resource, like fuel, so then I can do tricky, sticky, painful, awkward, uncomfortable work of that conversation with that patient, that tough decision to make with my coworkers. Like I do that from a resourced place when I am practicing pleasure. So this is, it's a critical part of anyone who wants to have, create sustainable change for yourself personally and, and also in the world. I'm very convinced, like show me where the math goes wrong you know, email me or DM me on Instagram. If you don't think it's true, I just really am very convinced by it. Okay. Okay. And with that, that concludes part one of what actually ended up being a two part, um, podcast episode. So, um, I'm cutting it off right now, um, because there's a whole other segment that as I was recording, I recognized, gosh, this is getting quite long. And I want to make sure that all of you who are listening get time to digest this material. Talking about pleasure, maybe it's comfortable for you, but it's actually not even that comfortable for me. I'm glad to be stretching myself by doing it and giving it the time and attention that I really think experiencing pleasure deserves. So in the second part that's coming out next week, you'll hear more specific principles from pleasure activism that I hope will help make it even more accessible for you to consider 
adding more pleasure, more enjoyment, just the lens of enjoying things deeper into your life. Um, But I wanted to leave it there for this first episode. So my questions for you to consider as we close this one off is, what are your pleasure practices? For sure, you already have one. You are a human being. There are things you're doing you're enjoying. Maybe right now you're judging yourself really hard for doing them or consider them guilty pleasures or things that you need to fix or change. What would happen if you opened yourself up to simply enjoying them? Even though you've been told they're bad for you, they're evil, da 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 da. What if you also acknowledged they're enjoyable to you? There's part of you that enjoys them and see what happens if you just let more of yourself enjoy them. Let yourself notice the impact they have on your body, including potentially you may say, oh, I enjoyed that. Now I don't need to continue. Like whatever that activity or thing that you do that brings you pleasure might bring. And when you're going through your day in healthcare, my other question I want to ask you to consider as you wait for next week and get more specific examples and ideas from me is what here is enjoyable? Which parts of this work that I'm doing, which is very stressful and very overwhelming, and most of it I probably don't like, just if you're anything like me, (laughs) but what are the pieces that my body actually goes, ah, that's good, that's yummy, that's nourishing, ooh, I love that, and like maybe make a little list, keep track for yourself. What are some ways that you experience pleasure in the midst of your work in healthcare? Paying attention to that can shift your experience, which is one of the first things I'll talk about on next week's episode. So thanks for your time and attention today. May you all have a more pleasure-filled week, both by paying attention to what's pleasurable and allowing yourself to actually enjoy what you're already doing that is pleasurable. And I'll talk to you next time.